Well, welcome to Tea Time. That's right. It is Monday. It is not Thursday. So you know what that means. It means it's a rescheduled Tea Time. Uh, So I want to welcome everybody for joining me today on Tea Time. But before we get started on today's show, I want to get you over to Miss Liz's YouTube channel. Give that little doorbell a ring and subscribe to the channel so you can watch these Tea Times at any time in your home, in the car, at a picnic, all of that good stuff. Um, And what does Miss Liz offer you? Well, I offer you over 300 different interviews from different guests from around the globe with different stories, different books, different services and organizations and all of that good stuff. So there's a lots of good juicy stuff in there. Now today I have the incredible Fern Brady joining me and she is back here. She was a guest that was scheduled for July, but you know what? Mother nature hits us sometimes and we have to just go with the flow, right? And that's what tea time's all about. We go with the flow. And I am honored to have her here. Uh, So let's do the disclaimer. Let's get some of uh, Fern's bio out there and let's get Fern in here and let's spill a tea on legacy in words. That's right. We're serving a different type of tea today. So get ready for that because we're going to have some deep conversations because we already started having some conversations in the background. So disclaimer for Miss Liz's Tea Time Live show. Miss Liz, myself, is going live using StreamYard. Before leaving a comment, please grant StreamYard permission to see your name at StreamYard.com. Please be advised that the content brought forth for any Tea Time show hosted by myself, Miss Liz, is always brought forward in good faith. However, may bring forth dialogues and opinions that are not representative of my platform. The facts and information are perceived to be accurate at the giving time of airing. All Tea Time Guests and audience participants are responsible for using their good judgment in taking any action that may relate to the discussion. The content brought forward may include discussions for some where they may be emotionally at risk. It's significant to know that this show is engaging in discussion forms only to offer and inspire awareness and connection and is not providing therapeutical advice. If you have any questions about the disclaimer or the panelist's discussion, you may freely contact me, Miss Liz, through my email at bookingmissliz at gmail.com. Moving forward, should you choose to voluntarily participate in today's show in any aspect, I myself, Miss Liz, welcomes you. And should you decide that the show is not made for you at this time, I respect those wishes and see you at a later date, at a later show in the future. So again, all Tea Time shows are done on Thursday, 3 p.m. and 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That's the original date for Miss Liz. If you see a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, it's a rescheduled surprise or a special tea time that is brought to the table that Miss Liz feels that needs to come to the table. So now a little bit on my guest. Well, who is Fern Brady? Well, Fern Brady is the founder and CEO of Inkling Publishing. She began her professional life as a foreign correspondent and taught for 15 years in Aleph ISD. She has published numerous short stories, two children's pictures books, and a couple of poems. Her debut debate debut novel, United Vidin, which is book one in her Ty- Tyrant's Galax- Gal- Galactic Wall series, I'll get her to say that, was given a glowing review by Doctor Who Online, the official site of the Phantom. Love Calls, which is a book, One of the Dragons and His Kitten, re- released in 2023. She also has a graphic novel collaboration, Mr. Landon Library, what the amazing, t- talented Rosa Maria Garza. She has returned to the late leadership of the Houston, Houston Writers Guild, but with whom she serves as a CEO for four years previously and is a full-time teacher again for the Sci Fair ISD. I'm going to get her to tell us what that ISD is because I'm curious about it. Now let me get Fern in here and let's spill some tea with you all. Welcome, Fern. Hi, thank you for having me. So did I, anything that I mispronounce, I'd, I, I'd like you to say it so that I we can get it out there correctly. The ISD? Yeah, yeah. well, I, I, the ty, Tyron Gallic, Gallic uh, Wall. 
Cyrene's galactic wall is what I call it. And that's very much, it's interesting because when you're looking at literature, right, you're reading a book, a lot of times in my head, I will be pronouncing the characters' names or places in a certain way, especially with fantasy stuff. And then I hear other people pronounce it, and I'm like, oh, wait, that's not how I've been pronouncing it in my head. But I, I think it counts however you pronounce it, you know? I, I had that with, what's the character's name in in, uh, in Harry Potter? Hermione, right? I think that's how you pronounce it, right? Hermione, that's how we found out on the movies. But, like, I don't remember how I had been pronouncing it in my head. Completely different, you know? But, uh, yeah, so Galactic Wall is the uh, is the universe in which my novels are set. Uh, basically, it's an alliance of 51 planets that was formed by Thyrene, the dragon heart, who was able to uh, get everybody to unite when there was a big threat in the universe. We are actually in the middle of it. Um, they are all around us. Earth is technically, you know, the, there as well. And the characters come to Earth every once in a while, kind of secretly. But there's a very specific reason why Earth is not, you know, drafted into or brought in officially. Um, and that's because we are not ready technologically to be brought in, right? So they are kind of biding their time until our technology is there so they can kind of approach us. And that's downstream many, many books from now. <laughs> well, that, you know that's really cool and I love that you said that about Harry Potter because there are things that we can't pronounce the same way right because you either a, a language barrier or something and I think it's okay to be imperfect, imperfect and say you know what I can't say it so let's get someone else to say it you know and let's get it out there um, but I really want to thank you for that uh, Fern the word, um, the word chasm right it's C-H-A-S-M, and I, I'd always pronounce it in my head, chasm, for some reason, but then I heard somebody actually pronounce it, it's chasm. But, you know, I think, I think when a reader mispronounces a word, I think there's an honor to it because you've been reading it, you know. So let's get in. I'm going to take you way back now. So who was Fern as a little girl and who is Fern now? Fern as a little girl is a very nerdy little creature um, who, you know, just was wanting to live in books. I loved uh, stories and I loved reading. And so my, my dad filled our household with books on the Knights of the Round Table and adventures and mythology and a lot of very fantastical uh, areas and books like C.S. Lewis, you know, Narnia and stuff. And so I grew up living in other worlds and believing in dragons and in magic and, you know, pretty much staying away from real world, um, which was a harder place for a real firm because she was a little chubby girl. And so, you know, uh, definitely was on the end of bullying, right? I was continuously being bullied and, you know, didn't quite fit in. And so books were the escape. Books were the place where I recited and hid out away from the bullies. So Fern, what got you into publishing? Well, you know, um, when I, I had already originally been teaching um, for ALEF ISD at the independent school district here in Texas, and, you know, we had been doing that for many, many years. And I met some people from the Houston Writers Guild. And I got involved with the organization. I started going to their conferences and meeting agents and publishers. And I met a lady named Pamela Fagan Hutchins who had started self-publishing her herself. Because at that time, you know, Amazon had opened up the platform. People could publish themselves. And so she wrote this book called uh, What Kind of Loser Does Indie Publish and How Can I Be One Too? And I read it and I thought, why well, could do that? I could run a small independent little publishing uh, concern. I could publish my own books. And 
I thought, you know, because it takes a lot of entrepreneurial elements. Of course, you have to be a business owner at heart. But beyond that, it has, you know, you have to have a certain willingness to do the due diligence of making sure the product is a high quality. You know, you can't just slap it up there super fast. You have to really work the craft and then work the quality of the mechanics and the grammar. And so I thought, you know, I could do this. And I had some money saved. I had some money saved up. And I thought, you know, I didn't have any books ready at the time, my own books. And I thought, well, if I start with some short story collection, some anthology, that would be nice. I could, you know, publish a vast array of uh, voices, you know, um, and start with multiple authors, you know, with these short stories, um, and then try to share. And so that's really what inspired me was this book um, that said, you know, hey, here's how to do it. Here's the basic essence of, you know, step one, two, three, right? Here's how you do it. And I thought, yeah, I could, I could totally do that. So how did you get the name? Yeah. Inklings Publishing. Well, so my favorite authors are C.S. Lewis and Tolkien, right? And they had uh, the Inklings Society. They formed the Inklings Society with other contemporaries of their time. And they would meet in each other's homes. And they would read each other's work and they would critique each other and help each other. Um, and they would do writers retreats and things. And so I'd always loved the Inklings Society name. Um, and so I thought, well, I'll just take Inklings and add publishing to it. And that's, that's how we got our name. It's a, a nod to my favorite authors. I like the name. I, it, thinks, it, it makes me think of ink dropping on paper. Yeah, and the lady that did our logo, um, she did a lot of po political um, branding and working with the different um, school board politics and campaigns and things. And um, and she came up with this this logo, and I was like, oh wow, this is so you you nailed it, right? The little ink cotton feather from way back when. And and that's what I like. I, I it's the history, right? And that's what we were talking about before we went live, right? Is the legacy. So I want to get into the legacy in words because that's the tea that you gave me. And we were talking about that backstage before we went live about the legacy on how we don't speak about it enough. So let's get into the legacy in words and what that means to you, Fern. Yeah. So uh, you know when you're kind of creating a company. One of the business plan elements, you know, things that you have to kind of really think about is your why, right? Your, your why are you doing this? You know, okay, yes, you could. You have the skill set, you have the money, whatever. But why do you really want to do this, right? And as I kind of explored that idea for myself, like why am I wanting to invest in books? Why do I want to have these books out here available for people to read? Why am I investing in these particular authors and their voice and their message and their books? And I realized that really, as a woman who, you know, being 50, I just turned 50, you know, and not having had any kids, I know I'm not going to have heirs, right? I'm, I'm not going to have children and grandchildren and so forth. And so to me, this is my legacy, right? The words and the messages and the themes um, and the entertainment and the stories that are left behind in these books, my own writing as well as that of the authors who I publish, this is my legacy. This is what I leave behind, you know? And in many ways, I feel really honored because this is a legacy that may impact many generations to come. You know, um, you don't know years from now who is going to pick up one of these books and who's going to read a story and have some kind of a response, a reaction, a desire to do something different for our world because they read something in one of the Inklings publishing books and by one of our authors, you know. And so it's a, it's a legacy that will endure and that's the hope, you know, for, for generations to come. These these words will impact hopefully many people. Well, and that's it, right? In 10, 20, 30 years, we don't know where our books are going to take us and who's going to read them. 
And, you know, who's going to be reading that book and saying, oh, does she have more? Does he have more? Like, can can we get more? Uh, so let's talk about your books. When did you start writing your own books? Because you're publishing other authors. But when did you start writing your own books, Fern? Well, I, um, I've i always been a writer. So I've always had, you know, manuscripts of this and that um, floating around. I, I recently opened up a tub of writer's notebooks uh, from when I was a kid, a teenager. And I realized I read a lot of pirate stories during one period of my life. I don't know why I was so in love with pirates in that moment. They're but, cute. Uh, Come on. Pirates are so <laughs> underestimated. I think they're, they're, they're feisty. <laughs> and they're, and they're, they're the bad boys, right? <laughs> so funny because like a lot of the characters that I love the most are outlaws, right? Technically, kind of outlaws, kind of rebels. But there's a honor to them, you know, there's honor codes to them. So I really love that. And I think that's one of the things I loved about pirates so much. You know, they had very egalitarian systems, really, considering the time they lived in for for their ships. And I think that's why also I I found a, a, a random Viking story that I had written, you know, because Vikings, you know. So apparently I'm into that kind of crazy stuff. But um, I've been reading these, but you know, the world of Thyrain and his galactic wall and these planets, planet Jorn, that was born in my classroom. Um, I taught sixth grade for 15 years. And in fifth grade, in uh, we have social studies, world cultures. And so, um, Every year, you know, we would talk about geography and how different how the geography of our planet affected the development of cultures. And we talked about different government styles and elements of culture. And every year I would have the kiddos make a planet. They would draw a map of an imaginary planet and they would put different geologic features on it. We would create different boundaries of political divides and we would develop our own stories. Our, we would develop some mythologies for these people, government stories, you know, the call to adventure quest stories. And there would be other creatures in it. So we would develop stories across these planets. And as I modeled uh, for the writing pieces, I was making my own planets, right? I made Planet Jorn and Verena and Amiel and the whole drama with the, what's going on in uh, in there, in United Vin. And so these stories were born in the classroom, in my, in my, with my kids writing and modeling and having them create their own cultures. And, you know, what a better way to learn uh, about world cultures and how culture develops and how it changes, right, um, is by creating your own making your own up and and making up your own laws and rules and mythologies and so they had a blast doing it and you know over the years these stories just got collected and when i took uh time away from from being a full-time teacher was working mostly with writing in the schools and doing part-time teaching i started doing more of my writing and that's when i met this lady and started a publishing company and that's when i got real serious about building these books and and um, yeah these worlds have captured me you know beyond anything else I'd written these were the more developed because I'd spent so many hours with my students working on them so when you wrote your first book how long did it take you to write it for oh my goodness okay so United Vidin came out in 2020 in the middle of the pandemic um and it took you know, to get it to a place where it was really ready, um, it took about 10 years, to be honest. Yeah, because I had started in the classroom, like I said, and but it was very fluffy in the classroom. Um, and, you know, we revised some because we're working on revision as well. As, as, but we had not done anything real deep. And so when we got more serious with it, um, that's when it began to morph. And it really was... Uh, a product of the critique groups that the Houston Writers Guild hosts, being able to share my pages and get some feedback on how other people are receiving it, 
how it's landing, what is clear, what's not clear, what needs to be more developed. And my work with Max Regan of Holodeck Press. Um, he, I had the pleasure of meeting him through a, a mutual writing friend who invited me to one of his June retreats. And he is amazing. He's a great editor and he's a writing coach. And he looks at your work, you know, as a whole. And, um, you know, he has been the one that has helped me to really form a, a piece of element to my universe. And so, yeah, it took it took about 10 years for it to really be in a place where you could say, oh, yeah, let's get it out there. Which is why, it's right? Because like it's right. a First well, one. and I think I think it's important for the listeners and audience to hear this, right? That not every book is written in two days. You know, some some take years uh, for you to get it together. Uh, you know, and so if you're thinking about writing a book and you're like, oh, I can't do it. I, I can't do it in two days. I can't do it in two weeks because there's so much pressure on book writing in today's world, right? And especially with the AIs writing all their own books and all of this now, uh, you know, it takes away from the process and the journey of writing these books and putting the content together and building the characters and all of that. So what was the hardest part for you to write in the first book? I think the hardest part for any author, I think, is realizing that the first draft really seriously is a hot mess that needs to be fixed. Um, you know, we all would love to write a scene, write a first draft and send it to an editor or whatever. And that person say, oh my gosh, it's genius. You're magnificent. Don't change a word. We would love for that to happen. But the reality is that doesn't happen. There's always uh, a lot to be improved. And I think that is the hardest part of writing is not wanting to rush. You know, we all want to hold our book in our hands. We all want it on Amazon. We all want it to be a bestseller. But if it's going to have a lasting legacy, it has to have depth. And in order to develop a story with real depth, with characters, with meaningful lives and meaningful changes and, and nuances that will resonate with people and make an impact in our world, then we have to take the time to actually develop that, to be willing to work it and rework it and rework it and get sick of it and keep going and not give up on developing the best level it can be in a rush to just get it out there. Yeah. Well, and that's the thing, right? We go right back to the legacy again. A legacy is not rushed, right? It's not done in 24 hours. It, it takes time, you know. Uh, what legacy are you guys leaving behind? What legacy would you like to leave behind, you know? Uh, for all my listeners out there, I, I'd really like to know what your legacy is. And, you know, join the conversation. If you have any questions or anything, I'll throw them in the comments. Uh, you can, if you want your name to be seen, you can private DM us on the Facebook page and I'll get the questions out. But I think... Legacy, we don't speak about it enough, right? And we keep going back into the legacy on this conversation because it's deeply important that we take the time to understand what we're leaving behind. Um, I'm going to switch it up a little bit, Fern, and I'm going to take you on to a different planet, a different time, a different zone, right? We're going we're gonna to travel today and we're going to have some fun. You gave me the legacy in words, but before we went live, you shared an important story about a cup. And tea time is about the cup of ourself, right? So I want to go into that cup. You have a special cup with you, and I want you to share the story of this cup for the listeners out there so we can take a deeper look into our cups. Okay, so this is the, this is the cup. And when you invited me on your show and it was tea time, I was like, oh, my gosh, I'm going to be drinking from this beautiful cup. Um, because this cup um, was purchased by my mom. And she bought two, a set, and it was for her and for me. And it's just ours. And so when I hang out, when we sit together to just have a mom and daughter time, we make our coffee, not tea, sorry, not a tea drinker. 
<laughs> and that's okay. We don't need to drink tea on Tea Time with Miss Liz, right? But we drink our coffee with this beautiful heart cup. And it's it's really cool because she has hers and I have mine and they're matching. And it's a it's kind of our special moment when we sit down together to drink from these. Like we don't use them every day. We use them on very special occasions when we're we're gonna have these, you know, mom-daughter talks. And, you know, kind of circling back to legacy, that is a legacy in and of itself, you know, being able to share with your parents, grandparents, you know, uh, have taking the time, taking some time from your world to meet with these beautiful people and get their stories, get their wisdom, gather it up. You know, we don't take time anymore to sit and drink a cup of coffee or a tea and just talk about life, about where we've been as a people, as a family, and the the great wisdom that's lost, you know, as we lose our grandparents. Um, you know, I had the privilege when my grandmother came the last time before she passed away, she decided just arbitrarily to, um, you know, have me sit down with her and write down some family recipes. And, you know, she tried to, like, say, okay, well, how much of this spice or that spice, right? But, you know, those recipes don't have exact measurements. It's a pinch of this, a little bit of that, you know? <laughs> right? The grandma recipes was, like, how many cups is that, grandma? You try to write... I don't know. It was a cup and a half, maybe. I don't know. I just went with the flow. Oh, a little bit. Oh, I needed that a little bit more sugar. Taste it. But that was the thing, right? They were always tasting as they were creating, you know? Yeah. And, we, and we've gotten out of that as well. We're just throwing ingredients together, throwing things together, throwing words together. And we're not taking the time to taste it and to, uh, to serve it and understand why we're doing this and why we're going to these different uh and journeys and paths and that and that's why i said i wanted to take you to a different planet a different ga galaxy right because that was a different time the legacy of grandparents right the legacy of connection and having that moment making these special moments and holding on to them um and you know tea time always goes in a different different avenue i never know where it's going uh you know that's why i like to meet my guests a few minutes before so we can get into different conversations and sometimes i guess we're like oh i kind of like the way we did that so i for you know we travel in life on these paths and journeys right like you got into the publishing before you even started writing your but you were doing short stories all along you were teaching all along so you're working with words all your life uh in different ways um we have a question here what is the isd oh isd is um independent school district so uh basically it's the public school system in texas where i live um we have different um school districts and they're independent of each other although they are connected by the texas education agency you know, of Texas, but uh, each, each is, you know, like you, you read about Houston ISD. Uh, it's the independent school district for Houston, the, the metropolis. And then like A-Leaf is kind of a suburb uh, area, the ISD, Fort Bend, Sci Fair. These are all kind of the uh, surrounding kind of suburbs, if you will, neighborhood areas. They used to be independent cities, um, that Houston sort of swallowed up as it grew and that it kind of over and it's still growing. God, God only knows how big it's going to get. It's a, it's an ever growing city. It's currently like the fourth largest in the United States. Oh, um, yeah. Houston, it's, it's quite an incredible metropolis, you know, it, it, and it's funny because it's big and it's a city and you have the feel of being a part of a city bustling. But at the same time, it has a lot of a more small time feel as well. Like when you're living in these areas, these little neighborhoods, you know, you have a little bit smaller pace, but not really because you're still in the bustling city. You know, traffic is horrible. Just traffic. Well, isn't there a saying about Texas? Everything is big in Texas. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, we have definitely the biggest of pretty much everything, including roaches, which is just threatening. Those things should never have 
this big. I don't know what's going on with that. Right. And that's what I mean. We're traveling to Texas right from our own homes right now, guys, right from your cars, wherever you're listening in. Right. We're traveling and we're and we're getting to see the big Texas. <laughs> yes. Yes. And, you know, we recently here in Houston got had a hurricane come through and a tornado had come through shortly before. And so we had quite a mess with our power structure and the infrastructure for um, that's why we had to reschedule because, oh my gosh, we were, we were literally powerless, which is an interesting way to spend your, your 50th birthday. Let me say, um, the week of the hurricane was my, my birthday week. And I thought, well, what a way to enter to the next, you know, half century of my life, you know, with a hurricane in the dark, you know, powerless. Great. <laughs> Hopefully that's not an omen. <laughs> I want to. I want to take you back to the age of fifty because I just turned fifty in May too. I, did you feel like this transformation in your life when you turned that big five zero? Was it like a life changing moment for you? It, you know, it it was exciting. Like I, I don't know how it went with you, but like I was excited. I thought, oh my god, I've lived a half a century. You know, because we say 50, and that's a nice number. It's a very daunting number. But when you say it as a half of a century, right, Yeah. that has a different feeling. It feels so much more like, you know, you've reached this point at which you're like probably more than halfway through your life when you think about it. Because, I mean, how many people live to 100, right? I mean, that's the goal. That's my goal anyway. I want to live to be 100 at least, you know. but it's it's a heavy marker and you think to yourself okay where am i where what have i what have i been doing you know and where am i where am i going right that's a huge question these i feel like the years that end in zeros right you're 40 you're 30 you're 20 these are really important ones because there are times of assessment of like okay i've, I've closed a decade where am i going next when you close a half a century that's a big one to look at like okay where where have i been where am i going and you know how's it going do i need to make some changes <laughs> right it's like a an eye opening i know when i turned 50 it was like i've lived this long and what do i want to change in the next 50 years you know oh yeah and you was... start very serious about your health right yes. because you know when you're young you know, under 50, you have this sense of, oh, well, you know, I can eat a little bad because, eh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll be better later, right? But the consequences start showing up. They start showing up. And so you start thinking, okay, if I really want, and especially when you're a writer and you're thinking about a legacy, right? These, there's so many books in this series. There's so many stories in my mind. I know what I want to create, right? The bigger picture you start thinking, well, I better start getting a little healthier. I better start doing some exercise, start eating a little bit better because I want to last. I need to, you know, they don't get written super fast, right? So if I'm going to make it and have, you know, a good uh, opportunity to, to really birth all these novels, then I, I better get serious about being healthier. Yeah. Well, and, and that's the thing, right? When we're 50, it's really an eye opening to see like all of the stuff that we've done. And it's like you said, like it's half a century and not all of us will make it to hundred. My, my grandma made it to 97 she, and she refused to make it to hundred. She's like, I've seen enough of this world. I do not want to make a hundred. And here I am. I'm, I want to make a hundred because I want to have my granddaughter be able to celebrate her 50th birthday with me. You, you know, these are the things that I look at. Is it possible? Absolutely. You know, if you look at your health and you look at the story and the legacy that you're leaving behind, you know, it's a time to reflect on your life. And that's what tea is, right? We're reflecting. We're taking that time and that moment to recharge ourselves. Um, so I want to get into the second book. The first book took you almost 10 years. So how long did the second book take you, friend? The second one didn't take us long. Uh, it took two years to bring it out. Uh, Love's Call. Now, it's interesting because Love's Call is um, actually book one of a smaller series 
that happens before the events of United Vidin. Um, one of the characters that is going to be very important for the closing of the whole thing, like how everything concludes, um, is really a minor character, Nicomir. Um, but he is a half dragon, half human. And what happens when you throw in dragons in stories is they they have a tendency of wanting to take over the whole narrative. Okay. They think they should be the focus of everything. All right. And so I told them, you can't take over this narrative. This is not your novel. This is Verena and Emil's story. It's not you. So he insisted he needed his story told. And so I created Love's Call to kind of give us that background of who is Nicomir. And as we see him in developing in the main line, what I call the main line of the series, we, you know, when he comes to that place of making that choice and and helping in the way he's going to help, um, it it does help to see why, you know, his why he does that. And and it's uh, it's because of his own journey, right, that he's had. So this is uh, Love's Call was Nick and Anipia's story and how uh you know, how he is managing his own uh, storyline and, and what he's going to end up doing. And then, and you do see him, like I said, in United Bidden, you see him a little bit. And in War Rising, which is coming up in December, that is the story, the second part, right? What's happening next. You get to see him more. He starts interacting with them more. And uh, you're, you're going to see him more and more. But it's you can't build him into this this story because it's uh it's not his story he needs his own book <laughs> he's gotta wait <laughs> it takes time to build that dragon <laughs> i always tell people when i do workshops right writers workshops um you know i always go look if you get stuck throw in a dragon because they'll get the story moving but you have to be very careful because they will take over and before you know it, the story is all about them, right? And it was hilarious because this one lady was like, well, Fern, but I don't write fantasy. I write, nor you know, normal stuff. And I was like, well, what about a dragon in, right? What about if your characters uh, go to dragons in? And later, like, she texted me. She was like, you know, Fern, it actually worked. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, just be careful because the story will not circle around that dragon in, you know. The spirit of the dragon's there. I, I you know, that dragon really pushes us, right? Because it, but there's these little tiny dragons sometimes, you know, that can really just take us on a different journey and take us by surprise. Uh so in all of your books, are there dragons? Um, all pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> So we got the dragons, but we don't got the pirates, right? <laughs> we love the pirates. And we love the pirates. I have to say, those stories really were dreadful. Like, I mean, I was very proud of them at the time I wrote them. But like years later now, looking at that, I'm like, oh my Lord Jesus, I seriously needed some serious help with these words. But, you know, um, it's very interesting because they, they, I loved stories with dragons and elves and, and dwarves and other creatures. In um, United Vidin, the the original inhabitants of planet Jorn were lizard people, the Gortiv. And there's four different kinds of Gortivs that lived on the planet. And then the, the colonized worlds of Drulin and Fraternin, they arrived and they colonized Jorn and they moved the Gortiv onto the continent of Parthia because it was less uh, less desirable for for them and um, and so they've been there all these years and now for the first time they're gathering together uniting under one leader who is wanting to say hey you know uh, this was our world and we want it back. And so it is a really interesting exploration. You know, a lot of the genesis for the for that storyline came from a lot of the conversations around Columbus Day and um, the the our Native Americans and how they were treated and how their lands were taken and their cultures. And so a lot of the genesis 
of you know this idea of hey what happens when you know colonizers come and they and what happens when people try to say hey we want our space back and how do we manage a reparation what what is what is just in these circumstances so a lot of this uh, series this first um arc in uh, the Tyrene's galactic wall universe has to do with that this idea of the colonized worlds and the people and and the different people and, and how do we see people who are different you know these are lizard people they they're humanoid lizards right um how do we live with and coexist with completely different kind of looking people right is it you know, I think Star Wars sort of uh, plays with that as well, and, and Star Trek as well to some extent. You know, these beings that don't look like us, yep. right? Uh, how do we, you know, it, it explores this issue that we have of prejudices, and you know, why does everybody have to look like us? Why can't we just enjoy that uh, different cultures are, are different, and and they look different, they dress different, they do different things, and why can't we enjoy that? You know, it's exactly. a it's an interesting exploration. Well, it's, it's enjoy, enjoying the differences between each other, you know? One might like blue, one might like purple. Doesn't mean that one is better than the other, you know, because everybody has their own likes and dislikes and beliefs. And, you know, so why are we devaluing everyone else's beliefs and and, and likes and dislikes and say, no, no, you shouldn't like that. And you should, you, you know, a lot of shooting going on in this world. Um, where I think I, what I like about galaxy stories and storylines like what you've done, Fern, is you've opened up the mind of understanding the difference between different planets and different individuals and, uh, you know, species and stuff like that as well. And we have species around us all the time. We have plants. We have animals. We have, like, it's right in front of us. You know, so when you're reading these stories about dragons and fairies, it's right there in front of us. Well, think about like, um, you know, shark infested waters, right? You read these words. Really? I mean, because as far as I know, sharks live in the ocean. Okay. They're not infesting the water. That's their natural habitat. Okay. The fact that you chose to enter into their water, okay, go into their homes, and that you look yummy to them is, you know, is not really the shark's fault. It's not, it's not like they're out there trying to be mean sharks, infesting these waters and killing these swimmers, right? This is their natural habitat. And, and we go there, right? And we have this very uh, egocentric view of like somehow the sharks should just stay away because you know now the humans are here or you know you see stories of alligators you know entering neighborhoods or you see the stories of the coyote right uh, or the wolves or bears it's like well you know technically they have a right to exist here this is their planet too yep. and we are in you know we are taking ourselves into their space so don't be surprised if we have interactions with them right and so a lot of this the beauty of fiction i think is that it allows us to explore real issues you know complicated issues yep. um in a very non-threatening environment because we're not we're no longer talking about you know native americans we're not talking about you know uh, black versus white, right, or racism. We're not talking about lizard people. Okay, we're talking about lizard people. And so we can explore these issues without so much uh, of that natural defensiveness that comes when those conversations arrive, right? We, we can explore them with more ease because they're about lizard people. You know, we're talking about lizard people on another planet. And so we can have that conversation more openly in many ways, then, then when we would sit down and go, let's have some tea and discuss racism and white supremacy in America, right? That is going to be a very heated conversation versus yeah. let's talk about Gortins, you know, and those lizard people over there, right? That's and how did they drink their tea? <laughs> Do they drink tea? <laughs> right? 
Well, the lizards, oh, you know, they, they drink with their tongues. So, you know, there's a different way of drinking their tea. We tip it up and, and, and they, they stick their tongue in. You know, there's different ways. But what you really said was really important, Fern, is, you know, animals coming into our habitat. Well, we're going into their habitat. So it works both ways. You know, we can't say they can't come in our home if we're going in their home. You know, so I think it comes right down to respect, right? Respecting society, respecting species and understanding them instead of being so in the mood of just taking everything out, right? Let's just remove this. Let's just, let's start understanding. Let's start getting to know each other. Let's start having these conversations like we're having right now, you know? Um, and let's talk about the lizard people because, you know, there's different species out here. Uh, do you feel that there are lizard people on the planet right now? Well, look, there's a whole conspiracy theory. <laughs> right? <laughs> yes, Miss Liz went down that path. <laughs> Because I have heard of the lizard people. <laughs> so are they real and are they on Earth? Well, I don't know. But I wouldn't put it past them. I really wouldn't. Because, you know, that's the whole premise of my, my book is that Earth has a, a sacred path, right? And um, and we are, we are not in a place where we can be brought into um, the more understanding of these these beings who have, you know, space abilities, space travel abilities. And so they have to kind of buy their time because, you know, technology wise, trying to integrate us would be too, too difficult at this level, right? Um, they are going to integrate us when we get to a technology level where it would make sense, right? It would be the transition would not be so hard. And so uh, that's the premise, right? Because everybody's always like, well, if there are aliens and they do space travel, why haven't we met any, right? That's why, because they're like, we're backwards. <laughs> we're backwards. <laughs> we're and so they're, they're waiting, they're buying their time, right? But they visit us, right? And so who knows? Who knows about those lizard people? But I, I feel like every, uh, if you're going to make up a fantasy world, I feel like there should be a nod to a lizard person somewhere, because I don't know, there's not enough lizard people in literature. <laughs> <laughs> Ern is looking for those lizard people. Come on, share your stories. <laughs> so I want to. I want to get into some of the authors that you work with, Fern. You work with a lot of different authors, and I've had a couple of them on Tea Time. Uh, so, uh, how did you connect with these authors, and what type of authors do you work with? Yeah. So we. So Inkling's Publishing is really a, a wide press. So we. Um, we're looking to sort of have a little bit of every genre eventually. Um, and so we started really, like I said, with this, these small short story collections, the eclectic writing series. And that's how we met our first author. Uh, Meg Halfdahl was the first author that we, um, that we had. And um, we met her because I was helping another publishing company do a, a short story collection as well. And she submitted there. And then we had Eclectically Criminal coming up. And so I, I kind of, I really liked her story and her voice. And so I was like, hey, you know, um, we're opening. So if you want to submit over here. And then she did. And so, um, and then when I read that story and we included it there, I thought, wow, this lady has a beautiful voice in horror, you know, uh, very unique and um, compelling. And so I approached her, actually. I was like, hey, you know, I really like these two stories. And um, I would love to do a short story collection with you. She was really a short story writer at the time. And, uh, and so she was like, yeah, that would be great. So, we, so that was our first um, author. We did the Twisted Reveries series, um, 13 Tales of the Macabre. And then we followed it up with the with the Twisted Reveries 2, which explored the town of Willoughby, Minnesota, which was uh, featured in a couple of the short stories. And she was like, oh, I'd love to like kind of delve deeper into this town that I'm, I'm creating. And then, you know, we moved into like, hey, what about a novel uh, based on that town and the history that you're now creating? You know, you built a world 
right? And that's how we got into her novels and such. Um, so she was our first one, and that's kind of how we met her. Um, and then we have Andrea Barboza, who is a contemporary romance writer. Um, and she wrote a story based on uh, mythology, right? It's a, it's a you know, godlike looking Greek hero, right? And, and he is an archaeologist and he comes to Houston. And he meets an archaeology student and they fall in love, right? And he did something interesting with that one. Uh, most series in the romance genre uh, have, you know, a, a closure, like the, the couple, uh, they fall in love and they have a happy ever after in that book. And then the next book in that series takes a different couple, right? That is in that same storyline, but like a minor character now has their romance. It might be a brother, a sister, a friend, right? Um, but we actually did uh, a trilogy with Andrea Barboza under her pen name, um, Andrea Bailey, uh, where actually the romance doesn't close and they don't have a happily ever after in book one. They actually end up splitting in book one and then they come together again in book two and then eventually in book three, they, they, uh, they finally have their happily ever after, right? Um, so that was a very different take. And being a small press, we can do that, right? We can take take a little bit of liberty with some of these genres and, and stretch and, you know, maybe not need exact, you know, because we're playing with what we can market. Um, and it, it's an interesting thing as we watch readers receive that, you know, they're not expecting it because the genre, this is new, newer in the genre. Um, so we have Andrea Bailey and... We also have um, Mac Little, okay? She's writing a pirate story. Much better pirate story than I wrote, let me tell you, <laughs> okay? <laughs> She's magnificent. Um, and her stories are, are all about the 16th century Caribbean era and the Maroons, you know, the enslaved peoples there and how they created, um, they freed themselves and, and they created a society there. Um, and it's a, a, an area of slavery the history of slavery that we don't usually read about, that we don't hear about. You know, we think about it only kind of in terms of the mainland U.S., but in other parts of the world and in the new world, there was a lot of slavery. And so um, this kind of, and she mingles it with pirate stories and romance, and it's wonderful. And her writing is beautiful. It's just poetically beautiful. It's just, I fell in love with her writing. Um, and most of these authors met through the Houston Writers Guild or through projects like we put out a call for submissions. And then um, we are open for submissions. Jay, uh, Jay Lynn Els is one of our authors. She is a, she wrote a series of the of Avalon, right? Based on a, it's a contemporary girls. They get pulled into the land of Avalon and they have adventures there with the Knights of the Round Table and kind of a surprising twist to some of those characters. And um, and we met her, she submitted, you know, she she just submitted to us. And, you know, out of those uh, submissions, we, we picked her book. Barbara and Carl is our latest one. Um, short story collection again of, uh, you know, stories that are set in the restaurant. Uh, that's the newest volume that, we, uh, that we've published. You know, she, uh, all these stories, um, happen and they're all sitting in a restaurant and you get to see, you know, this couple story and this other and the maitre d' and the, the bus boy. And so it's kind of surrounding the, the, this evening at Tony's is the, the story. And she's working on a, on a murder mystery, uh, that's going to be a little trilogy there. So, so we're looking for, she's, she's doing our murder mystery kind of genre, but we're looking for all the genres. Right? We're really wanting to bring in um, a little bit of everything. Um, my father has a uh, Ramon Del Villar. He's one of our authors. Let me tell you, working with your father as your author can be complicated. I Just can't imagine. <laughs> <laughs> but he, because you know, he worked for the federal courts all his life, he retired. Um, and so he has seen a great deal of cases and all kinds of situations, you know, legal situations. And so he writes 
um, characters, you know, an attorney. It's an attorney that is here in Houston and he has these cases. And especially he goes up against banks because in my father's opinion, banks are just evil. And I agree. <laughs> <laughs> I can just imagine how it is to work with your father, uh, you know, uh, especially when it's with family, right? Because then you got to give that hard feedback back and you got to be like, oh, I'm not sure about this and where you're going with this and all that. So we had to assign him another editor, you know, couldn't work with me because, you know, we could be a little bit stronger with him. Like, uh, this, these are the revisions. We <laughs> <laughs> and he probably pulled the dad card. <laughs> yes. It's not easy, let me tell you. It's not easy. So, Fern, if anybody would like to reach out to you or to connect with Inkling Publishing, how can they reach out to you? Well, you can just go on to our website, um, inklingspublishing.com. We are open for submissions through the end of this month, actually. We have a window open. Uh, we've been collecting wonderful options. And our um, acquisition editor is looking at uh, options right now. And then um, you can connect to us also with the fernbrady.com. Um, that's my personal author uh, website. And uh, yeah, we're on Facebook. Mostly we're on Facebook. We had Twitter. We're not very successful on Twitter. Um, you know, I always tell authors like pick the one or two platforms that you can do well and then you know really push those and don't worry about the others because you it's better to do a couple really well and deeply and connect with your readers than to try any and not really have much success meg for example is really great at twitter she uh she has a great following through twitter you know and um she's not that big on on facebook so it's really about what works for you and finding that one social media or two platforms that really work for you. Jay Lynn does TikTok and Instagram videos. I know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, my son got me on TikTok. I think it's like three years, four years now I'm on TikTok. And I'm still trying to figure that thing out four years later. Like, uh, you know, but I, I get the stuff out there and I'm thinking all the other stuff, I'm just like, you get so focused when you get on those platforms because then you, you're wasting time, I find. Um, you know, for the longest time, I was watching people scoop up gems for hours, and I was like, I'm not even getting these gems. Why am I watching this? You know, um, so, so from what final message do you have for everybody out there? Um, you know, the, the most important thing is to really explore why. I, I really like that is the one. Uh, question you need to ask yourself on a regular basis, at least once a year, you need to really sit down and look at why am I doing what I'm doing? What what am I doing? Where am I spending my time? Which is a really valuable resource that we often misspend because we don't pay attention to it. And, you know, ask yourself, is this something that is purposeful? Is this bringing a, a return on investment? want to accomplish in my life, you know, and, and really explore why, what is your purpose? You know, because I find that if you really have a purpose, if you know why you're here and what you're trying to do with your life, the legacy, right, that you want to leave behind, what are you trying to accomplish? Then you will be more focused and you will be more successful, um, you know, rather than, you know, just sort of um, not really. I, I see a lot of that with retired people, right? Um, if they, re if people retire from, uh, it is not as powerful as if you retire to, right? You retire to do something that you've been wanting to do or, or such. But don't wait for your dream, right? Don't wait until then. Start building it now, you know. And it's hard because it's a lot of work, but it's a good way to spend your time, you know. 
Well, thank you so much. It was a pleasure having you on my platform and getting into these different conversations and bringing legacy to the table, right? Uh, so if anybody would like to know more about Miss Liz, you can check out my website at www.misslizz, is T-time, no S, T-time, uh, .com. And if you'd like to connect with Fern or uh, have her as a guest, reach out to her. Uh, again, her website is uh, www.inklingspublishing.com. Check her out there. Check her out on Facebook. And I want to give a special shout out to Mickey Mickelson, who has given me another incredible guest. Uh, check him out as well. Creative, uh, Creative Edge. Uh, Creative Edge, right? I, I think yes. I <laughs> I always I I got so many of these people that uh you know that come to me and I just want to thank you all for working with me and collaborating with me to have these incredible conversations. So let's keep the tea flowing and I will see everybody on Thursday with two new TEAs to serve and we'll see where that takes us and have a good conversation. So until then, keep serving your tea and let's just make a difference one cup of tea at a time with real life stories and words. Until then, Miss Liz will see you on Thursday.